throw to second. And they got him. O'Neill hits it to left field pretty well. Finds it back at the track. And the Reds lead. Van Swyke will tag at second. There's the catch. And the runner moves on to third base. And he's down. Up the middle. And lock it. He got it. Strap yourselves in for round three. On a day marking the man whose daring maritime voyages opened up a new world, or so they say, we too find ourselves journeying upstream. The riverboat rivalry that began on the banks of the Ohio has carried us through changing tides to the spotted western Pennsylvania, where the mighty Ohio meets the Allegheny and the Monongahela. They call this the confluence of the three rivers, and it is here that we will make a discovery of our own, folks. Who will lay claim to Game 3 of the National League Championship Series? Will it be the Cincinnati Reds or the Pittsburgh Pirates? And hi again, everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien, and welcome back to our continuing coverage of the league championships here on CBS Sports. Jack Buck and Tim McCarver are at Three Rivers Stadium, and they'll be along shortly. This is Columbus Day, and we hope that if you're off from work or school, you're going to spend the afternoon with baseball and us. Everybody here in New York City is in a festive mood. We've had the traditional parade up Fifth Avenue, and guess who was the Grand Marshal? Lee Iacocca? No. Governor Mario Cuomo? Uh-uh. None other than Los Angeles's L.A. Tommy Lasorda. If there's anything Tommy knows better than pasta or diets, it's the playoffs. And uh, Tommy, what do you think? I got a ball for Cincinnati, their National League Western Division team, Lou Pinella. I got a pull for them. If I don't pull for them, because we brag about the National League West, we think the National League West is better than the National League East. That's what we believe. Meantime, in Pittsburgh, we've got ourselves a parade of left-handers. Danny Jackson for the Reds and Zane Smith for the Pirates. Jackson, a former 20-game winner, has been on the disabled list three times this year. He hasn't faced uh, Pittsburgh since 1988. Meantime, Zane Smith, well, the Bucks' well-traveled southpaw, he came over from Montreal and has been nothing short of a godsend. He's won six of his last eight, including that uh, one hitter against the Mets down the stretch. And with Smith on the mound, manager Lou Pinella has decided not to play Paul O'Neill, a left-handed hitter who has been one of the Reds' bright spots so far. Glenn Braggs will take his place in the outfield. And as we check in at uh, Three Rivers Stadium uh, with our man James Brown, and JB, what a difference a year makes. You know, last year Zane Smith was 1-13 for the Braves and the Expos. How has he been able to turn this thing around? Well, a significant difference indeed, Pat. And as Zane Smith gets set to take the mound today, one of the most favorite topics of conversation centers on what is the definitive reason for his better pitching here in Pittsburgh. Now, keep in mind, he did undergo elbow surgery back in 88. And as you mentioned, with the Braves and Expos, he was a combined 1-13. in 13. But the most relevant stat is that he's 6-2 and two with Pittsburgh, and the Pirates couldn't be happier. We needed one more piece at the time, and we got Zane Smith, and he stepped in good. And uh, he was at a time in his life, like Earl Weaver used to say, uh, lefties always develop late, and he's just right. Well, Zane is tough because he uh, doesn't really have a pattern. He changes speeds well. He'll, he'll throw uh, four different pitches, and he can get all of them over for strikes. So uh, you have to be patient with him, but, but yet you have to be aggressive because he throws strikes. I think just a chain of, change of scenery did a uh, word of a difference for him. Uh, you know, when you got an offensive ball club behind you like the Pirates, uh, your pitchers, you, you can pitch the same way, but your, your, uh, your record's going to probably improve a little bit. Now, Zane Smith is not a very emotional guy, nor is he a big talker, so I had his catcher, Mike Lavalier, ask him what he feels is the reason for his better pitching. Is it because of the change of scenery here in Pittsburgh, better run support, or in fact, is he healthy? And Zane Smith simply said, yeah. Well, on the injury update front, let me tell you that Jeff King, the starting third baseman for the Pirates, was doubtful for today. That's because he wrenched his back in game two and left the game. But he did receive back treatment. He is feeling better. And just after batting practice, he said, I'm going to give it a shot. And that's exactly what he's hoping to provide for the Pirates. Let's go back to Pat in New York. All right, JP, thank you. And uh, on deck, we'll check in on the American League story. The world champion A's are tired and hurting, but they're tired and hurting, and they're back home. 
That story and more as our Columbus Day coverage of baseball's championship series rolls on for the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria here on CBS. Stay with us. CBS sports coverage of Game 3 of the 1990 National League Championship Series is brought to you by Lennox. When it comes to quality and heating and cooling, must be a Lennox. And by John Deere, nothing runs like a deer. It is a warm, overcast day in Pittsburgh, 71 degrees. Little chance of rain, but uh, don't worry, folks, we'll get this game in today before supper time. And as you look uh, at a rested pirate team, you know, a lot has been made about the NLCS taking the weekend off. Well, let's make a little more of it. Down the stretch, the Pirates played 16 games in 17 days. So after Friday's day game in Cincinnati, they took that one-hour flight to Pittsburgh and as the bus drove them to pick up their cars at Three Rivers, every member of the team fell fast asleep. And talk about a tired bunch of guys. Here's the Oakland A's getting off their charter at 5.30 in the morning Pacific time. Must have felt like a very long trip for Walt Weiss. He sprained his left knee when Ellis Burks of the Red Sox broke up this double play last night in game two. And as he walked, uh, well, you can see gingerly off the team charter. We asked him if he'll be playing tomorrow afternoon, and you can see him shake his head, no way. And as for Boston, they had the same travel itinerary, but uh, the flights, as they say, always seem a little bit longer when you lose. And no team has ever lost two at home and come back to win an LCS, but the Sox are trying their best to contain that sense of despair. And uh, game three, as we said, tomorrow afternoon, we'll have it for you at 3 o'clock Eastern time. When we come back here, we'll show you how superheroes like Mike Lavalle and Rob Dibble are breaking out of their shells. We'll explain that after a word from your local stations. Well, now we'd like to share some notes from the underground. And if you thought Major League Baseball players liked what they do for a living, here's somebody with some real enthusiasm. I love being a turtle! So, how does Turtle Power make it in the locker room of the Cincinnati Reds? After all, they have their own identity as the Nasty Boys, but it seems the chief Nasty Boy, Rob Dibble, has been uh, dabbling with a doll. What about the Ninja Turtle? The Every Ninja kid's Turtle. got one, right? Oh, my mother gave him to me, said I kind of look like uh, Raphael. Meantime, in Pittsburgh, even though catcher Mike Lavalier doesn't wear a green chest protector, he's got enough Ninja things. I've uh, received everything uh, from Ninja water uh, water bottles, uh, ninja cards. I uh, carry my own personal photograph of uh, myself and uh, and one of the turtles. This cowabunga, dude. And now I go out to a band that I am convinced no one has ever called dude. And if they have, it's been Mr. Dude, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jack Buck. Good afternoon, Jack. How you doing, Pat? Nice to be with you. And we are back to work. We played two games and had two days off. The Pittsburgh Pirates won the first game four to three and Cincinnati came back and won the nightcap two to one for the most part the defense has been outstanding and also for the most part the pitchers have dominated almost to the point Tim McCarver but they have stopped the big guys of both teams almost cold. well usually that happens the defense and the pitching go hand in glove as a matter of fact the big guns for both sides have not done a lot. For the Cincinnati Reds, the tandem of Eric Davis and Chris Sabo, only two for 14. And on the other hand, the big three for the Pittsburgh Pirates, five for 23, only one extra base hit and one RBI. I'll tell you, to show you just how tough the pitching has been, what we've done, we've taken it in microcosm. We've taken one at bat by Barry Bonds to lead off the, the or actually in the in game two against Tom Browning, an inside fastball, followed by an outside fastball. Kind of the ins and outs of pitching and the ins and outs of how Tom Browning worked Barry Bonds. So now with the count 0-2, Barry Bonds is knocked back away from the plate, and Browning comes back to finish him off with a slider away. So in microcosm, as we said, it's, it's a small sample. They've only played two games, but the pitching has dominated so far. These managers have been fun to deal with, and they tell us what they're going to do day by day. They don't lie to us either. And what did Lou Pinella tell us today? He told us, don't look for a bun in the early innings. And they won't bump, but we know the Pirates will. The two left-handers will tangle. Jackson and Smith, cloudy day, perfect for everybody, and we'll have a good game here. 
CBS Sports coverage of Game 3 of the 1990 National League Championship Series is brought to you by Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. AT&T, the right choice. And by Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Dr. Pepper is just what the doctor ordered. This is the first time the Pittsburgh crowd has had a chance to greet their team because they clinched the division title on the road. And so they gave them a prolonged ovation. And we've had all of the pregame festivities. It's going to take a moment to clear the field and allow these uh, players to get ready to take the field. And there's Mike LeBayer, the catcher of the Pirates. He's not in the lineup today. Don Slott is doing the catching. He's chatting with Gary Reedus and Sid Green, neither of whom are in the lineup as well. Now the Pirates take the field, and again they'll be greeted by this hometown crowd. And by the way, it is not a sellout. But I'm sure it will be an enthusiastic crowd. It always is. And the first time the Pirates are in the playoffs since 1979. To the mound is Zane Smith, former Atlanta pitcher, former Montreal pitcher, 12 and 9 overall. But six and two since joining the Pirates, and he threw them over the hump as they were trying to win the division title. Let's look at the Pirate defense. Big 1.30 earn run average, and behind Zane, Barry Bonds, 335 putouts, the most in the National League this year. In center field, former Gold Glover Andy Van Slyke, 88 and 89, he won the Gold Glove. In right field, Bobby Bonilla, the converted third baseman, back out there today. And at third, Jeff King. They didn't know whether he was going to start or not today, but he feels fine. There's some soreness, as JB was telling us before the game, soreness in his lower back. At shortstop, Jay Bell. His partner over at second base, the slick fielding Chico Jose Lind. And at first base this afternoon, Carmelo Martinez, his first start in the series. Don Slott once again behind the plate with the left-hander going for the Reds. And as Jack said, Zane Smith, the left-hander. And boy, is he tough. He started. Here's the lineup for Cincinnati. It should be a good one and produce a lot of runs ordinarily. Barry Larkin at short. Mariano Duncan at second. Chris Sabo playing third today and hitting third. And it's Eric Davis in left. Glenn Braggs, formerly of Milwaukee, in right field. Todd Benzinger, the switch hitter, gets the started first base he pinch hit he's one for one in the series Joe Oliver behind the plate Billy Hatcher in center field and Danny Jackson is going to be on the mound and it's a long time since he has pitched against these Pittsburgh Pirates the umpires are Paul Rungi behind the plate Dutch rendered at first Jerry Crawford in second Jerry Davis at third the crew chief is Harry Wendell Steno firing in left field and John McSherry who had the plate in the last game is working the right field foul line. There's Paul Rungi, whose father Ed was a longtime American League umpire. And the aerial view of Three Rivers Stadium. And there are a couple of thousand empty seats. These tickets have not been difficult to obtain. Jim Leland, the skipper of the Pirates. This is the best out of five, as it turns out now. And the leadoff hitter is Barry Larkin. Larkin won for five in this series, although he does have three base on balls, and he usually hits well in this park. And he hits well against left-handers, too, against Zane Smith. Three home runs, 13 for 30 lifetime. First pitch of the day is in for a strike, according to Rungi. I think you can, you can look for the Reds to be more of a potent offense this afternoon against left-handed pitchers this year, a 280 average, the best in the National League. And Smith with another hard hit, and it's scooped up by Jay Bell, and that's the way this game starts. Larkin is thrown out to Jay Bell over to Carmelo Martinez. That's a friendly hitter's park. It's 335 down the line in left and right. Power alleys are 375. Center field is 400 feet. This is almost the same as the stadium in Cincinnati, Riverfront Stadium. It's just a little bit smaller, but the ball flies in this park as it does in Cincinnati. This is Mariano Duncan looking for his first hit of the league championship series. And a strike to him. That's Zane Smith. He ordinarily gets ahead of the batters and he's done it to the first two. Duncan had 10 home runs during the season. Loves left-handed pitching. Chops it foul and that's strike two. 
Duncan, a 4-10 batter against left-handers this year. That led the major leagues. 4-10 batting average. You can expect a lot of ground balls from Zane Smith this afternoon. Duncan probably wouldn't have played in those first two games and been 0 for 6 if Bill Doran had been available for Cincinnati. Outside for a ball, and the crowd wanted a call. They didn't get it. One and two. His first five starts, he really took charge with the Pirates. Won his first four. He got that one by Duncan, who's 0 for 7, and the first two have been retired. And the crowd enjoys that. Ray Miller, the pitching coach, said that once he gets over the jitters, Zane Smith should pitch well today. He doesn't look like he's bothered at all, Jim. Not at all. Here's Chris Sable. He's one out of seven, as we mentioned a short while ago. He led the Reds this season with 25 home runs. And it is a strike on him. A little delayed call by the plate umpire. Well, Zane Smith has been ahead of all three hitters. And away to Sable. First two have been retired. Sable the batter. Late swing and a foul one and two. And I wonder if the Oakland A's are up and watching the game after their long flight home from the other side of the country. Arriving in Oakland at 5.30 this morning. Say that's a good eight hours. Well, just get, getting up. Get their luggage, get home, probably is 7, 7 30. Well, they have breast breakfast at Wimbledon. They're, the Oakland Athletics having breakfast in Pittsburgh today. So is he. I guess that's lunch now. Two and two to the batter. And a ground ball to the hole. That's a base hit for Sabo with two out. That one had eyes to the left of King, to the right of Bell. I think if the Reds are going to hit Zane Smith today, they're going to have to find some holes in the infield because Smith throws so many ground balls. A good sinker. And I would imagine that Sabo will be off and running. 27 of 31 that attempted to steal against Smith this year made it. Only four caught stealing. Eric Davis is up. He's one for seven with a run batted in. And you know what a threat he is in a ballpark of this sort. Zane Smith throws over to try to get Sable, who stole 25 bases this year. Martinez, the first baseman. First base umpire is Dutch Renner. Outside, Eric Davis. I think the Pirates can rely on their three outfielders, but if Cincinnati's going to score a lot of runs, this is the guy who's got to produce them, Eric Davis. Superb hitter in this ballpark. And he fouls one to even the count, one and one. Over a two-year period, period, Eric Davis, 18 for his last 34. He loves hitting here at Three Rivers. So he's the sort of hitter you can't give in to. You've got to try to work him. And if you lose him, take your chance on the next guy. But don't give in because he'll hurt you. Runner at first, two out throw to try to get Sable. Tony Perez coaching down there. I mentioned on a previous telecast that Tony is going to be eligible for the Cooperstown Hall of Fame come 1992. Pretty close as it turned out. Pretty close. That's that throw over to first base where Zane Smith steps off. And Sabo really wasn't prepared for Smith's throw over there. Very, very close play. Some pitchers can do that better than when they throw over there from the rubber like that. They get it over more quickly when they step off. Yeah, that high kick is distinguished between Zane Smith stepping off the rubber and throwing over there. You don't have to step toward first when you step off the rubber. In effect, you become another fielder then. Two out. Eric Davis hits it foul, and he's in the hole one and two. See, this is the kick that Zane Smith uses to go to first base, but that wasn't the step off. 
whenever a runner sees the right foot go behind the left leg, then he's free to run. Once that happens, the pitcher's committed to go home. Sable not running. Strike three, and you're out as he pumped a fastball past Derek Davis. He's now one for eight. A base hit for one left, one half inning. No score in Pittsburgh. Pretty picture, you now know why they call this Three River Stadium. Allegheny, Monongahela forming the Ohio, and Danny Jackson on the mound, six and six for the year. No record against Pittsburgh this season, and two and oh, lifetime against Pittsburgh. Here's the lineup for the Pirates. Jeff King at third, Dave Bell at short. Then you start with the big guys, Andy Van Slyke in center, Bobby Boney in right, Barry Bonds in left. Carmela Martinez at first, Don Slot behind the plate. Jose leaned at second base, and Zane Smith, you just saw he allowed a hit, but got out of the inning. And the leadoff batter is Jeff King. He was picked off second base the other day and jammed his back, sliding back into the base. And a foul out of play. He's a big swinger. He's had 14 home runs, most of them after the All-Star break. So he hit his stride late in the year. And he's a better third baseman than Wally Backman, with whom he sometimes platoons at that position. It'll be King Bell and Van Slyke. And the pitch goes low. Danny Jackson, with that very unusual motion, he really gets low to the ground. As a matter of fact, so low, he wears a knee pad on his left leg. Right there. Fastball and a devastating slider. Foul ball, one ball, two strikes to Jeff King. And Jackson is used to postseason play. 1-0 against Toronto in 85, and then 1-1 one one in the World Series for Kansas City against St. Louis. So the jitters shouldn't get to him. King didn't miss, didn't get that ball down and in. A perfect spot, perfect spot for that pitch. The fastball up and into King. You can see Joe Oliver, the catcher, sitting there. Jackson just about hits the glove. Pitch was up a little higher than I thought it was as we view it behind home plate, but an effective pitch for Jackson. Will now pitch to Jay Bell. The shortstop. He's two for six. And every once in a while he surprises you with a home run. He has seven. It's a slow roller to Duncan. Two out. You mentioned the 1985 season. Two of those games that Jackson won. One was game five against Toronto when the Blue Jays were up three games to one, a must win. And the other one, game five of the World Series, when the Cardinals were up three games to one, a must win. So you are talking and looking at a money pitcher right there, a guy who finished second in the Cy Young Award two years ago to Oral Hershiser. And Van Slyke hits third in the lineup. There was a time when he didn't play every day against left-handers. And Jackson misses to him. How about that? Zane Smith, number one, only three earned runs in the first inning since joining Pittsburgh. And Danny Jackson, number three. Jackson falls behind Van Slyke and Mar and Mart shot the owner of the Cincinnati Club he watches. Van Slyke couldn't catch up with it. Two and one. That's a better seat. Marge has a better seat than she gave the the Pittsburgh wives in Cincinnati. Yeah. That's that's one of the controversies. Mike Lavalier, Jay Bell, quite a few of the Pittsburgh ball players very upset that their wives weren't treated better in Cincinnati. Put them up in the nosebleed section. The pitch goes outside of Van Slyke, and the count goes to three and one. And they were upset about that. And they will be pumping if it's around the plate. Hit 17 home runs during the season, and Jackson allowed 11 home runs. Fly ball in the left field, carrying back, and it'll be handled by Eric Davis. So, with those two pitchers, little wonder we have a scoreless first inning.
That's Bobby Bonilla out in right field. What did he think of having two days off? I think it was very helpful. I think uh, we needed the days off. I think both sides needed it. And uh, it was nice to have it, especially for myself. I played in 160 games this year, so for me it was just a, a pleasure to have a couple of days off, and I think it's going to do me some good. And especially days off at home. Baseball players do not enjoy, for the most part, a day off on the road. Jim Leland said, oh, it doesn't matter, the day's off. He said, if I win, it'll have been good. If I lose, it would have been bad. Here's the leadoff hitter, Glenn Braggs, in his first at bat in the playoff. Pirates came home. They worked out on Saturday, not yesterday, because the Steelers and the Cincinnati Reds came in last night after working out two days in a row. Jay Bell rolls to get Braggs, and there is one out. And Bobby Bonilla talked about those days off. He didn't stay home all the time. You know what he did last night? Went to the hockey game. He watched the Penguins defeat New Jersey, and they told me he must have signed a thousand autographs over there, Tim. Lemieux and company, huh? Yeah, well, Lemieux's not playing, but they're getting plenty of goals for the Penguins. But when he had people lined up by the hundreds to sign autographs, there's one out, and here's Benzinger, one for one in the playoff. Switch hitter, strike call, Dan Smith, that's him. Might as well go up there swinging, right? Lou Pinella said about the two days, oh, I don't care. He said, I just didn't keep playing. Up the middle, and Bell gets to it. He's been busy. And he usually is when Zane Smith is pitching. That's his third chance. That's where Ben Singer hitting the curveball. That's where Zane Smith crosses you up occasionally. He is a sinker ball pitcher, but he will mix in an occasional curveball. All of the outs so far, either assists by Jay Bell, three of them, and two strikeouts. And one little hit managed in between. That's a pretty good fastball, and it's inside to Joe Oliver for ball one. There's Jay Bell, the shortstop, and a close up look at the Cincinnati catcher. those eight home runs three of those home runs this year hit off Zane Smith the last seven at bats for Joe Oliver he has three home runs off Smith and on that pitch, one and two with two out I mentioned the other day about Oliver the way he's hung in there in quite a few years in the minor leagues before he made the grade with Cincinnati he's their best catcher Two balls, two strikes. Our other catcher is Jeff Reed. Three and two. We're in the second, no score. Only one base runner, Chris Sabo, who singled and was left down in the first. This pitcher, Smith, has had four complete games. And a solid base hit. Something about ball players. Once they get some hits against a certain pitcher, they can't wait to get up there again. Even pay your way in to hit against some guys, and that appears to be the case with Joe Oliver. In facing Zane Smith, now 10 for 22 lifetime. And it brings up the number eight hitter, Billy Hatcher. Down at first base, you see Carmelo Martinez playing behind Oliver, who is not a base running threat. There are two out. And ball one. A lot of folks, I bet if they made out the lineup, would have had Hatcher hitting against Oliver, but Lou Pinella had a reason for this alignment. He likes to have a number eight hitter who can run, who can be bunted along, driven on by the leadoff man, who ordinarily doesn't have a lot of power. This third base coach is Sam Perlazzo, who had been with the Mets last year. He ended up in the right spot. <laughs> he sure did. And we showed you Tony Perez earlier. He's coaching at first. There are two out, and Billy Hatcher corks one into left field, rather deep, chased by Bonds. This might go, and it's a home run. So the Reds jump on top. A two out hit by Oliver, a two run homer by Hatcher, and the Reds lead two to nothing. Smith 
gets the fastball up, and Billy Hatcher takes care of the rest. Billy Hatcher, a member of the Pittsburgh Pirates last year, traded in March of this year to Cincinnati. He comes back to haunt his old teammates. Dean Smith knew that he had trouble on his hands when that ball left the bat, and so he'll pitch to Danny Jackson. It's a foul. Jackson, not a very good hitter. Becky, the bad hitter, two out of 37. Man made a good play on that foul ball. That's Billy Hatcher's first home run at Three Rivers Stadium and 148 at bats. He picked the right time as far as the Reds are concerned. That base hit by Oliver was a big one, as it turned out, with two out. You remember the first game of this playoff? Cincinnati got three runs in the first inning and the Pirates came back and Pittsburgh won it so early leads don't dismay this club one and one one and two during the regular season Zane Smith gave up 15 home runs it's about an average number. He puts Jackson away and gets his third strikeout, but a big blow was struck by Billy Hatcher. And after an inning and a half here, Cincinnati has taken the lead two to nothing. Bonds knew early that it was gone. Two to nothing, Cincinnati. Ordinarily against a left-handed pitcher, Gary Ritas would be playing first base or the outfield for. Pittsburgh, but he hasn't done well at all against Danny Jackson, so Carmelo Martinez got the call. 0 for 17 for his career. Carmelo Martinez, on the other hand, 6 for 24, so a slight edge, and that's what every manager looks for in a very close series, and this is one. Trailing 2 to nothing, the Pirates send up Bobby Bonilla. Corks it hard to the shortstop. Oh, that was a bullet to Barry Larkin, and there is one out. Can't hit it harder than that and still be out. What are his initials? BB. And that's what it was to shortstop, a BB. Fastball on the outside, Bonilla packing. And I mean, this was a seed to short. BB hits a BB. Larkin was not casual when he caught that one. <laughs> Here is Barry Bonds, the pitch inside. He's one for seven in the playoff. But left-handed pitchers don't bother him. I'll tell you one of the big things, and really, the players were pleading for good weather. They wanted an overcast day, and they got it. If you remember the son, Eric Davis, a good basketball player in high school in Los Angeles. But the outfielders, especially the left fielders, Barry Bonds and Eric Davis, Certainly wanting an overcast day and no trouble with the sun. This is the last day game either of these teams are going to play all year, whether they win this thing or whether they go to the series. All night games from here on out. Ball one to Bonds, strike on the corner. A look at the umpire, and it's one and one. Four in a row set down by Cincinnati left-hander Danny Jackson. On the corner. Give him another look, all right? One and two. Two perfect pitches by Danny Jackson. This is one umpire in the National League the batters don't fool around with. Or pitchers or catchers. Off the fist, it stays one and two. Paul Rungi doesn't take much gab, and he really is regarded as one of the best umpires in the National League. One ball, two strikes. Two. I think all umpires are more resilient in the championship series because they realize the pressure on the guys. The winner of this goes to the World Series, and they understand that. Danny Jackson picks up his second strikeout and retired five in a row. <laughs> Nothing but nasty right here. This slider getting Barry Bonds. Oh, that's a tough pitch. Ball darting away from Bonds. Remember, the slider breaks parallel to the ground. The curveball breaks perpendicular to the ground. That's how you at home can tell whether it's a slider or a curveball. And batting with the bases empty is Carmelo Martinez. He's a big swinger, strike one. Usually with him, it's 
All or nothing. He doesn't try to use the whole field. He's a slugger and he hit 10 home runs in limited play this year. Started the season with the Phils. He laid off one ball, one strike. And Jackson has made some very good pitches here in the early going. And I imagine the Red Sox and the Oakland A's are watching this one intently. Popped up on the infield. That'll be six in a row retired. First baseman Benzinger makes the catch. Two easy innings for the Reds and Jackson. Two nothing Reds. They've done a wonderful job of getting rid of the smoky image of Pittsburgh. They modernized downtown. The stadium has helped. And a shot from the Goodyear blimp. A thousand feet above. That's the American. The pilot is Captain John Moran of Spring, Texas. They did not sell this game out. Tickets are not that difficult to come by. So if you want to come over here to Pittsburgh and watch, watch some postseason action, I'd be happy to have you. Here is Barry Larkin. He grounded a short his first time. Zane Smith jumps ahead on the count for strike one. Went to Moeller High School in Cincinnati. Larkin watches one sink low one and one. Kim Griffey Jr. went to Moeller High School. Buddy Bell, Bill Long, the right-handed pitcher for the Chicago Cubs. Jerry Faust used to coach there, former Notre Dame coach. Off speed pitch. He turned that one over a little bit. Larkin's in the hole one and two. The pitchers for tomorrow night's game will be the same two who started the opener. That's Bob Walk charting the pitches. And Jose Rijo, who went in the first game for Cincinnati, will get the call again. And tomorrow night at 8 Eastern Time. Dane Smith to the leadoff hitter, Larkin. And that ball is foul, according to Dutch Renner, the first base umpire. And the crowd held their breath on that one. The count stays one and two. Smith gave up, gave up a base hit to Sabo in the first, a two out single to Oliver in the second, and then the home run by Billy Hatcher. That ball off the end of the bat, it, it started out like it was going to be way foul, and then it came very close. As you see, it hit the line about four feet in front of the base and just squirts foul at the last minute. This is the leadoff man in the third. And a line drive in the left, and Bonds takes it easily. He does everything easily. That's the first out here in the third. But they've teed off on a few pitches by Zane Smith. Bonds is probably the best left fielder in the National League. With Eric Davis right behind him. Here's Duncan. I'd like to get the monkey off his back. He's 0 for 7 in the playoff now. 0 for 8. Two out. Hey, and are, strike takes care. They are they are hitting the ball very very hard. Jack mentioned earlier about Bill Doran. He had problems. He was operated on. Had his lower back operated on. But Doran wouldn't be starting today. Duncan. As we said earlier, the top hitter in baseball against left-handers, Bill Doran would have, however, started the first two games against the right-handers. But he is out for the year. Here's Sabo, single to left, and was left on in the first. In for a strike. Win the. Pirates come to bat. They'll be looking for their first runner in the bottom of the third. Here's a foul ball, strike two. So Zane Smith struggling a bit, and Danny Jackson has taken the bit in his mouth. Well, he started off very well. Park at line to left. Duncan fly to center. Usually they hit the ball on the ground against this pitcher. Out of play. Stays over two. See the home run came by Billy Hatcher and then he struck out Danny Jackson in this inning the line drive by Larkin to start the inning and then the deep fly ball by Duncan 
So Zane Smith, they are hitting the bottom part of the ball against Zane Smith, not the top half. Uh, pitch wasted outside. Billy Hatcher's first home run ever here at Three Rivers Stadium. And he used to play for the Pirates. Yeah. Sabo to the borderline pitch, two and two. That was close, but outside. With two out. He almost cut it loose, but held up three and two. Might be a bigger question about that pitch, however. That curveball very, very close. Sabo diving into it, but then he takes it at the last minute. And now another right down the middle, and he took that one. That's a fourth strikeout for Zane Smith. Two to nothing Cincinnati into the bottom of the third, and we'll return to Riverfront Stadium after this word from your local station. Chris Sabo has a hit today, but he took that pitch down the middle. I bet he's still upset about that. He's one for nine in the playoffs. Well, Zane Smith had just missed with that curveball, that 2-2 curveball, and maybe Chris thought he was going to come back with another one. Just froze Sabo on that 3-2 fastball. And now we come down to the bottom of the Pirate batting order with Don Slott. He is 0 for 2 in postseason play this year. And ball one from Jackson. No runners for Pittsburgh thus far. They really have slot played to every field. They don't know where to stack the defense against him. The count is one ball, one strike. It'll be slot. And then leaned. And the pitcher, Zane Smith, who is a so so sort of hitter. Former Yankee Don Slot. Hits it hard into the corner. That ball is fair. That ball is going to be a double. It's a ground rule double. It came back on the field after leaving the field. Hit that ball hard to the first hard hit. The theme song of the Cincinnati Reds this year is You Can't Touch This. It's a song. It's a rap song by M.C. Hammer, and up until the third inning, the Pirates have not touched anything that Jackson has thrown, but just like M.C. Hammer, Slot wraps out a hit. And he's perched at second base. And it's Chico Leaned up there. All one to him. Leaned has had a couple of hits in postseason play, including a long home run in Cincinnati the other day. Tied the game only to find the Pirates letting it slip away. Ball two, and the crowd is alive for the first time. Speaking of first time, Pittsburgh drew over two million people this year for the first time ever. That's right, two and one. Second, nobody out. Now, lean ordinarily it's the ball to the opposite field. I don't know if he's intent on doing that in this at bat. He was trying, and the count is two and two. Yeah, but the question is why? Why move the runner to the right side with a pitcher, the left handed pitcher coming up? Of course, his natural stroke is there. You know what he's trying to do. Slots at second, nobody out. But why hit the ball to the right side intentionally with a left handed pitcher coming up? Pirates are down by two runs, not one. Runner at second, nobody out, and a fly ball into right. And the runner does not tag. Now he does, but he'll not advance, and there is one out. That was a tentative swing, and it appeared that Lean was just trying to move the runner to third base. But you've got to realize where you're hitting in the order. An eighth place hitter can't move that runner to third like guys in the middle of the lineup can. You see the slider in, a tentative swing. That's an inside out swing. There are some times that that play is applicable, but not then, in my opinion. 
Up comes Zane Smith. He had two runs batted in this year. And he had 11 hits. You wouldn't expect him to hit Danny Jackson, but you never know. Late swing and a foul. We're in the bottom of the third. Two to nothing. Cincinnati on the Billy Hatcher. Two out. Two run homer in the second. Slot with a leadoff double. Now there's one out. Dane Smith another foul. Strike two. And a different look at Don Slot. Neither the second baseman or the shortstop can hold him very close. Ball one. Funny thing about Slot right there, he was on the Remember the academic All-American team at UCLA, and his nickname is Sluggo. How many academic All-Americans have nicknames like Sluggo? That doesn't sound like an academic All-American to me. Foul ball keeps Zane Smith up there. No, they don't go together, do they? No. Sluggo, the academic All-American. Make any sense? There's Sluggo. Ian LeVayer share the catching for the Pirates who by the way have only two catchers. That's on the corner and a strikeout for Jackson is third one in each inning. Crowd trying to help the umpire. Danny Jackson on the disabled list three different times this year. That was a close call right there but he is throwing awfully hard. No off speed pitch to speak of. He's got the early innings have to concern Jim Leland. Fastball slider. And I mean that slider is eating those pirate hitters up so far. And this fellow struck out his first time, Jeff King. He could tie it if he gets his pitch. And Jackson gets ahead on the count to him. Pirates one hit, Cincinnati three. Strike call. Between Jackson and the umpire, they're killing these batters. And that's strike two. Slider on the inside, and now the fastball on the outside. Once again, working both sides of the plate. First pitch, that slider tight, and then the fastball on the outside corner. And he's getting the calls from Paul Rungi. Those have been good pitches. 0 oh 2. Then he'll make it chase a bad one. One and two. That was different there. That was that backdoor slider. That's by design. The slider on the outside part of the plate. A lot of times the hitter will see that. And he'll adjust to the slider in and then take it. That ball just off the edge. See Oliver trying to pull it into the strike zone. Runner at second, two out. That's got a piece of that one to stay up there. Front Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, bottom of the third. Home run by Hatcher in the second, and it's two to nothing, Cincinnati. Jim McCarver and Jack Buck with you here in Pittsburgh. One and two to King. Ground ball to third. Long throw by Sabo. And the Pirates get the first hit and lead the first runner. We played three innings. Cincinnati's leading it two to nothing. CBS Sports coverage of Game 3 of the 1990 National League Championship Series is brought to you by today's Chevrolet, who invites you to see why more people are winning with the heartbeat of America. Kentucky Fried Chicken, nobody's cooking like today's KFC. And by Michelob Dry Beer, once you experience the bold taste with no aftertaste, there's no going back. It's a day off for the Red Sox and the Oakland A's, a travel day for them. And we're doing battle here, going into the fourth inning. At Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh. This is Columbus Day. Quite a few of the kids. Day off from school. Perfect day to come and watch some postseason baseball that they'll remember for a long time. 
They'll remember it more fondly if their Pirates can come back and win. They trail here two to nothing in the fourth with Eric Davis leading off. Ball one from Zane Smith. Davis struck out his fast time. Last time up there. Fastball got it. Strike one, one and one. You saw those figures. What a prolific hitter he is in this park. Another guy in the National League hits very well here against Pittsburgh is Jack Clark of San Diego. Fly ball into the right field corner going foul. And into the Pittsburgh bullpen. Davis ran into a wall the other day. His shoulder is hurting a little bit. He leads it off and takes the count to two and two. Ooh. Wrong with that one. I thought it was high. Three and two. Funny, I think they're trying to pitch Davis right above the hands, but pitchers don't get that pitch anymore. Here's a fly ball into center for Andy Van Slyke on a 3-2 count, and that is four in a row retired by the lefty. That's right. That used to be a pitch that the batters used to love to hammer at, but it's not a strike any longer in baseball. Strikes about the letters, but from the waist to the letters, you don't get that pitch that often anymore. And this one crowded Davis, and he flies out to Van Slyke. Even not putting the good part of the bat on the ball, he still hits it fairly deep to center. Braggs grounded to short his first time. Ball one. Braggs came over on the 9th of June from Milwaukee. And he really helped with his hitting against left handers. He batted 339 against southpaws. In a Cincinnati uniform, one and one. Hard hit and a base hit. You don't usually see Zane Smith hit this hard. Well, again, Cincinnati, one of the top hitting teams in the in baseball against left-handed pitching. We mentioned as a team they hit 280. You also were talking about Eric Davis running into a wall. It wasn't. Braggs. I mean, he is built like a wall. He's more built like more like Fort Bragg than Glenn Braggs. He's a big man. Man, I'm telling you, he's like a football linebacker. He just got the fourth Cincinnati hit. And it brings Todd Benzinger up there. He can handle the bat. They might do some running here. One on, one out. Martinez is the first baseman. It's a good time to do it. You take more chances when you're ahead. You have a two run lead. The bottom of the lineup coming up. There goes a the runner and a foul ball. Strike one. The reason you're more inclined to hit and run with the bottom part of the lineup coming up is that you can't rely on them to produce runs by themselves. Even though in this game it was Oliver and Hatcher who produced the, the runs. But Lou Pinella properly putting Braggs in motion. See him look back. See if contact was made and Ben Singer fouled it off. Davis flight out, Bragg singled. Benzinger grounded out his first time. And he hits it to Chico off his glove. I think he misjudged that ball, and the runners end up at first and second. Benzinger shot one to lean. And it didn't appear that he had the best timing going after that ball, or perhaps it was just too hot to handle. Yeah, I think he jumped too quickly. By the time the ball got to him, he was coming down. He had not reached his apex. Unbelievable leaping ability by Jose Lean, and if he doesn't come up with it, no second baseman will. Well, he might have done all he could on that one. As it turned out, that ball was hit hard also. From a flat-footed stance, he can jump over teammates. Six-foot-tall teammates, flat-footed, jumps over them. If they duck. No, jumps off from flat footed. I'm telling you. Unbelievable leaping abilities. They don't duck. He jumps over them. The fact. Well, let's see what happens with Joe Oliver up. He singled the left his first time and scored ahead of Hatcher on the home run. Two on and one out. Zane Smith has to do some good pitching here. 
all one. And the Pirate fan. Now the Reds have five hits. Pittsburgh only one. Outside to Oliver. Remember that Oliver in the past has had the number of this pitcher, Zane Smith. Visit to the mound by Ray Miller, the pitching coach. I think what's happening is Zane Smith getting up under his fastball. That causes him to lead with his elbow and leaves the sinkers up high. A lot of times, if you throw that high sinker, your catcher won't catch a lot of them. Zane Smith, the most proficient pitcher in baseball in inducing double play balls this year. He's thrown 34 double play balls and 141 opportunities. That's about 25% of the time, when he has a runner at first and less than two outs, he gets a double play. That's remarkable. There it is right there. He certainly needs one here. Right, and Benzinger running the bases with one out. Double play ball. Two hits, one left. The Reds have left two, but they still lead it. Two to nothing. Back here at Three River Stadium, bottom of the fourth inning. Let me bring you up to date on the Jeff King back injury. Again, that occurred in the second inning of game two when Jeff King was leading off base, tried to make a move to get back to second base, and he wrenched the lower back. Now, over the weekend, he had been undergoing hot and cold treatment, as well as some treatment on an inversion table. Now, today, the bottom of the second inning, when the Reds were on defense, trainer Kent Biggerstaff took him to the clubhouse and put him on an inversion table. That's right, hanging him upside down by his ankles. When he came out, I asked the trainer, what was he going to do the rest of the way? Just heat treatment. I asked Jeff King, how did he feel? He said, loose. Let's go back upstairs to Jack and Tim. Well, he says he feels loose, but he's getting that heat treatment. He's 0 for 2 with a bat. Sounds to me it's more like a Houdini treatment, hanging by your heels between right. innings. I can figure out a lot of things I'd rather be doing than hanging by my heels between innings. <laughs> King made the last out in the third inning, and so Jay Bell will lead it off here in the Pirate fourth. Pirates trailing 2 to nothing. Danny Jackson, the pitcher. And ball one. Crowd's getting into it a bit. Their club has only one hit, one base run. And it's ball two from Jackson. Jackson struck out three, walked none. This batter plays the piccolo when he's up there at home plate. See his fingers moving. He's taking any way to get on. That's a strike, two and one. Bell has had two out of seven in postseason play. That's fair. That's going to be a double unless Eric Davis misplays it. Two base hit. Second hit for the Pirates. Second leadoff double, as a matter of fact, the difference is the big three hitting behind Bell. When Slot let off the second or the third with a double, you had your eight and nine hitters coming up. Boy, I'll tell you, he fights off a good pitch and hits it rather hard down the left field line. Good hitting by Jay Bell. Now Andy Van Slyke fly to left his first time. Four out of eight in his career against Jackson. And Van Slyke would like to pull the ball and move Bell off second base. You've got to get these run back, runs back somehow, one at a time or whatever. Let's see the approach of Van Slyke. Trying to left his first time. Strike one. Pirates led the National League during the season. And look at the series. One for 14. And today they had the leadoff double, and he, he was stranded at second. Don Slott in the third. And now 
Now lead off double by Bell. pulling the ball against Danny Jackson and he throws pitches like that you forget it you just got to try to make contact if you move the runner in the process that's fine but with those sliders biting away like that left-handed hitters just got to try to make pure contact this guy's tough to pull I've been in man slight changes his approach now with a two strike count Jackson came inside one and two the all pitches are not designed to get you out and that was one pitch that wasn't designed to get Dan Slyke out, but this next one will be probably a slider away. Remember, the Pirates have already lost a runner from second base. Nope, fastball inside. Slyke took a good look at it, two and two. See, the one thing you don't want to do if you're a catcher is get location with a runner on second base. Because if you give an inside pitch, then the hitter knows that a fastball's coming. You can't throw a, a slider or a breaking ball inside. We'll see if Oliver gives location again. Slider away. 2-2 two, two the count. 3-2. Well, so Jackson had this hitter set up, but hasn't been able to put the ensuing pitches where he desired. And it's 3-2. and two. Jim Leland, his club trailing, two to nothing. And he wants some hitting out of the middle of this batting order, and it hasn't been forthcoming to this point. And Van Slyke got a piece of it. See, if the runner at second base is given the signs to the hitter, and the catcher gives location. The only pitch you locate is the fastball. That's the only one you locate. So if you see that variety of signs going down, several signs, and you see the catcher going to one leg or the other, you know it's a fastball. Another 3 2 pitch. Puts the tying run on base. And the big guy is coming up. The slider misses low and away. A good at bat by Andy Van Slyke. He was in the hole 0 and 2. Coerces a walk. Jim Leland's got to be happy with this matchup. Banner Bobby Bonilla. He smoked one. A line drive to short his first time. He's two out of nine in the series. Corks it foul. Ask the third base coach, Gene Lamont, strike one. The Pirates grew up there swinging. They're an aggressive group. They're playing in a hitter's park, and they try to take advantage of it. O'Neill well, hit 32 home runs this year. More from the left side than the right side. The fastball away to Bonilla gave location again. Up the middle, base hit. White stops at second. Two to one. Joe Oliver watching point to his right leg right there. That's the sign fastball away. You don't know whether they're getting the signs or not but by the very fact that he points to the location you can deduce what's coming. Fastball away base hit. You got it. And Slyke didn't challenge Hatcher with nobody out. Now the batter is Bonds. First and second nobody out. And a pop fly for the first out. Shortstop wants it. Larkin. Foul ball as he caught it. One out. Interesting. No infield fly rule then. Of course, it was a foul ball, but 
Barry Windlestead, who was the closest to Larkin, responsible for the call, but because it was a tough chance, it wasn't an infield fly rule. It's got to be a, a clean chance for an infielder. It was foul anyway. But had that ball been a fair ball, then it would have been a, an interesting call as to whether the infield fly rule should have been in effect. Scott Scudder warms up for Cincinnati. And a visit to the mound by the second baseman. Mariano Duncan in talking to Danny Branson. He had something to say to his pitcher, and Bonds failed, and this pitcher, Jackson, got the better of him. And up is Carmelo Martinez. Up to first is first down. That missed inside. On at second base, Van Slyke, he'll score the tying run on any hit out of the infield, and Bonilla's at first. Jim Leland put Martinez in the lineup today. Let's see if he pulled the right string. That ball is fair. The Reds might take the lead. They're going to hold him up at third, and we're tied 2-2 on a double by Martinez. If you're Danny Jackson, you just got to tip your cap to the Pirate hitters. Another tough pitch that Martinez spanks down the left field line. Jay Bell hit a good pitch. Bonilla hit a good pitch. And now Martinez. We've got a tie ball game. 2-2 to the score. Now they're going to give a walk to Don Slott. And load the bases. Huh? Not every manager would do this. This would be the second pass given up by Danny Jackson. Here's the way this inning has gone. A double by Bell. A walk to Van Slyke. RBI single by Bonilla. Bonds fouled out, but Martinez double home a run, and they are walking slot. And we'll see if Vanilla pulled the right string. I'll tell you something about this next batter coming up there. As you see the overall picture, at Three Rivers Stadium. Chico Lean is not a good double play ball man for the opponents because he hits the ball to the opposite field frequently, but we'll see what happens. Base loaded, one out. 2 2 the score. And Danny Jackson gets ahead on the count. Runner at third base is Bobby Bonilla clapping his hands down at second Martinez and slotted first. And they are playing in. Lane didn't get the breaking pitch. That's strike two. that leaned grounded into 20 double plays during the season. That's quite a few. Now let's see what he does with the base and loaded one out. He's in the hole. He's out on a strike on the outside corner. What a pitch. Well, I'll say right on the outside with a fastball. This fastball just splinters the outside part of the plate. Man, making a pitch when you have to. He didn't quarrel. He walked away, and unless Zane Smith does something, we're going to end up tied after four. Ball one. And his first time had 11 hits during the season. Base is loaded, two out. Hits two walks in the end. A little clunker back to the pitcher. And we're 
We're tied after four. Now the Pirates have left four, but they have caught Cincinnati. And after four innings, we are tied to a piece. This game summary is sponsored by Budweiser. Looking back at this game in the second inning, a two out single by Oliver and a two run homer by Billy Hatcher. Pirates waited until the fourth inning. They had a double by Bell, a single by Bonilla, double by Martinez. And we are tied. We had a 4 3 game, a 2 1 game, and 2 2 going into the fifth inning of this one. Tip of the cap to Lou Pinella. And he's tipping his own cap after giving that intentional walk, and it paid off. Struck out lean and got the pitcher. Lou, one of the few managers in the major leagues that still wears his watch when he's in uniform. You ought to be out of uniform wearing your watch. Here, the strike to Zane from Zane Smith to Billy Hatcher, who cracked the home run into left center in the second inning. His first home run ever in this park, and he used to play for Pittsburgh. His first hit in the playoff, he's one for four. Baseball, one of the only team games, if not the only team game, outside doubles tennis without a clock and lose wearing his watch. <laughs> one ball, one strike. Catcher batting in the number eight spot. He gets ahead on the count, two balls and a strike. Up and that ball is a base hit, and after hitting a home run, he's going to get a double. Van Slyke gets it back in. Zane Smith allows another base knock. That's number six for Cincinnati, and the pitcher will probably try to bunt him over to third. In game one, we were talking about the lanes of the plate and how it was important for guys to go inside and outside. Well, for a guy like Zane Smith, it's important for him to stay down in the strike zone because he throws a sinker. And most of the hits off Smith this afternoon have been up. Well, Hatcher with a home run and a double. And the batter is Danny Jackson. I was watching Jackson practice his bunting the other day. He was doing a very good job of it. And every once in a while, he would pull the bat back and swing at it. So let's see what he does here. First baseman charging. Bunt foul. Bounced up and cracked him in the head. Uh, what, you, what he's trying to do here is make the third baseman feel the ball. You remember in game one with Bob Patterson on the mound? This hits him in the jaw. That doesn't hurt, though. Remember with Bob Patterson on the mound in the ninth inning, first and second, nobody out? We talked about it the next day. You try to get the third baseman to feel the ball, and that's what Jackson's trying to do right here. What do you mean that didn't hurt? Nah, that didn't hurt. <laughs> he bunts the ball to third, and King has to field it. Though so Jackson did his job and Lean took the throw. Five four on the sacrifice. See when you get the third baseman to feel the ball then you get him away from the bag. Now that's where the runner's going to. So that's why it's important to make the third baseman feel the ball. Good bunt by Jackson. See King vacates the bag. Hatcher's over in the sacrifice successfully. Fine job of bunting by Danny Jackson. And that's one of the reasons why Canella has Barry Larkin batting in the leadoff spot. He said, when I bunt a runner over, I want to have somebody up there who can drive the runner home. Larkin with 65 RBIs on the season. That's a lot for a guy who batted in the number one hole most of the year. Infield is in. Larkin takes ball one. He's grounded to short and lined out to left. And there we see King Bell and on the right side leaned and Martinez playing in for the play at the plate. Ball won the count. Over but low. That's ball two. How does it look from upstairs on the Goodyear blimp? We did have some rain this morning here in Pittsburgh. So you see those wet patches? And it looks like a pinball machine, doesn't it? 
Runner at third, one out. Pirates just tied it, Cincinnati. Threatening here in the fifth. And a foul ball makes it two and one. At the end of today's game, Tim McCarver and I will select the Chevrolet most valuable player of the game. Chevrolet will then donate $1,000 in the player's behalf to the Special Olympics. Larkin trying to get Billy Hatcher home from third. The squeeze is a possibility here. That one caught the corner. Running the count to two and two and diminishing the chances yeah. of the squeeze play. Now with two strikes, because obviously if you bunt it and it's foul, it's a strikeout. Leo DeRocher used to like the two strike squeeze play when he was manager. There was never anybody who bunted a ball better with two strikes than Rod Carew. And that ball is fair and the throw. Say. There's an interesting play with King making the save but unable to throw him out. And a bang bang play at first. Now we'll see with the infield in, the runner at third has to make the ball go through. That's why Hatcher dives back to third. The third base coach told him make the ball go through. He steps on third. And now remarkably, I think he has him. I think I think Barry Larkin was out. What a play by Jeff King to save a run, but I think. He got an out that he wasn't given credit for. So it's first and third, one out. What a play by Jeff King. There's the, he's got the glove and the foot comes down. He was out. Here it is again. He's out. Foot's not on the bag yet. He's out. Great play by King. And the call was safe, and it's first and third with one out, and Duncan is the batter. He's 0 for 2 in this game. Strike one to him. And this pitcher, Zane Smith, who got one double play ball early in this game in the fourth inning, would like another right here. 2 2 the score in the fifth, first and third one out. Uh oh, deep into left field, might leave the park. It is gone for a three run homer. And it's 5 2 Cincinnati. Pirates were thinking double play, but the batter was thinking something else. He was thinking double pump. We talked about it before. Duncan 0 for 8 before this home run. The leading hitter in the majors against left handed pitching. And he gets a fastball right down the heart of the plate. Doesn't take him long. Boy, I mean, he gets all of this more to center than to left. He wasn't sure it was gone for a period of time, but then he knew. Seven and a half years in the Dodger organization, coming to the Reds last year. Two home runs against Zane Smith, further evidence that he's getting the ball up. It's the second one he's watched sail out of the ballpark. One by Hatcher with a man on, and this one by Duncan. With two on and Duncan's first hit of the playoff, as Tim told you, he picked the perfect spot, makes it five to two. Now a strike into Chris Sabo. Mariano Duncan, Chris Sabo at the dish. He's one for two. Boy, the ball sounds good here when you hit it in this park, doesn't it? Sure does. One ball, one strike to Sabo. That's low, two and one. That's a funny thing, you know. When you really hit a ball, you don't you don't hear the sound as much as when you don't hit it well. There's that little click, that healthy click off the fat part of the bat. When you don't hit it well, you hear it more than when you hit it well. Chasing a bad ball low, it's two and two. It's that sound that is pure to, to all hitters. It's that little click, and that's what Duncan has done. That's what Hatcher has done. Click, click, five to two. Right-hander is Bill Landrum. The left-hander is Bob Kipper in the Pirate bullpen in the right field corner. Bouncing ball to short to Jay Bell. That's the second out of the inning. Well, tomorrow we have a doubleheader of League Championship Series. It starts at 3 Eastern for Game 3 of the American League Championships. 
between Boston and the world champion Oakland A's. And then tomorrow night, CBS Sports, live prime time, 8 Eastern time, the fourth game of this one between the Reds and the Pirates. So a doubleheader on CBS tomorrow. Eric Davis fouls one. He still hasn't hit his stride. He's one out of nine. But the so-called lesser hitters are doing it for the Reds. Hatcher and Duncan. Ball one. In the fifth and Cincinnati has regained the lead 5-2. Don't count this Pirate Club out. They've shown us a couple of times already how well they come back. Two and two. One and two on the foul. Here's Bill White, the president of the National League. He doesn't care who wins. He just wants to see good baseball. Former Giant, former Cardinal, former Philly. Easy travel between these two cities, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. He was also a former announcer. That doesn't mean when you quit announcing, you become the National League president, does it? Does for him, I guess. That's the way it worked for him. Davis waiting. Two and two. That home run by Duncan took the wind out of the sails of this crowd. He waited until he was 0 for 8 before he got a hit inside the Davis. Three and two. Putting the whammy on Cincinnati. Struck him out. Davis in one out of ten. But three runs on three hits. And Cincinnati's back on top. The score 5 2. Very nice, Jack. Pirates bad in the fifth inning. Let's look back at a championship moment in the National League from 1972. We'll have a look at that after Jackson pitches and Jeff King lines one in the left foul and out of play. King is 0 for 2 with a strikeout and he grounded out to third base. After Jeff King does something on or out, we'll have a look back at the championship moment in 1972 that you'll enjoy. King with a bad back 0 for 2 and apparently didn't get a call on a wonderful defensive play he made at third base and it cost Pittsburgh a run. Danny Jackson with new life. He had that tough fourth inning. Bob Prince a longtime announcer who died here a couple of years ago for the Pittsburgh Pirates suggested the fans that they bring out that green weenie and put the whammy on the opposition. Here's King punting foul. Make the count two and two. And also is a good luck charm for the Buckos. Prince, a member of the broadcasting wing of the Hall of Fame, is a wonderful broadcaster here. Whatever he suggested, the fans went along with. Then he came up with Babushka power. He had all the gals wearing <laughs> Babushkas to the ballpark. And they did believe in those days. And they believe this year, too. And they want to believe again. First time in the playoffs in 79. And remember Jackson had that trouble in the fourth with three hits and a couple of walks. And the pitcher made the last out with the bases loaded. Pirates have left four. Goes to three and two to Jeff King. He's seeking his first hit in the playoffs. He is 0 for 4. Now Jeff King leads it up. Different situation here, a 3-2 pitch. Pirates keep coming back. We're seeing the type of op offensive production from both teams today that we used to see. Jay Bell, who has one for two, is up. Strike up in the zone. Strike one. Come on, Jay Bell. Uh, Jay, I'll 
against that fan. He's been an effective hitter with runners on base. One and one. Reds have eight hits and the Pirates now have five. Jackson has to get through this fifth inning to be credited with a victory if the Reds win. Bell hits it at pass third, a base hit. And Bell is such a good bunter, it was surprising to look up and see Sable playing as far in as he was. And that ball zipped by him on this turf. Well, the first two are on, and here come the Bucks. I think Sable had an idea about Bell bunting. Not only is, it, is he a good sacrifice bunter, he had 39 this year, but whether Sabo was back or in, that's a base hit all the way. Here's Van Slyke. These Pirates keep doing things. We can't show you that championship moment, but we will. Van Slyke drew a walk and scored a run in the fourth. He's the tying run at the plate. Hits it in the left, might drop. That ball is caught by Davis. He made a good play. Make no mistake about Davis. Sore shoulder, bad knees previously. He is a wonderful defensive player in center or in left. That's the first out. Gold glove to his credit. And a gold glover hits it. I tell you, Davis eats up so much ground, and you don't think that he's running fast. He makes a relatively easy play out of that ball. That's sign for Bobby Bonilla. He's hit the ball hard twice today. He lined out the short. He singled the home run. Two on, one out. We hit it hard again, but foul. Strike one. And Tony is always moving about up there. He hops up and down and he dances. Strike. On deck is Barry Bonds. In the stands, his daddy, Bobby Bonds. What a great player he was. Now he's saying, Come on, Bobby, for Bonilla. And Jackson got that low pitch past him one and two. Yeah, that was a biting slider there out of the strike zone. Watch it, watch it bite down and in to Bonilla. Bobby swinging over that pitch. That was a nasty slider from Jackson there. And Jackson's ahead on the count, one and two. Bumped him up for the second out. Infield fly rule applies. First baseman Benzinger makes the catch, and they're two gone. So the Pirates put their first two on, and it indeed will be up to the younger Bond. struck out and fouled out to short. First time any Pitt Pittsburgh Pirates player has been in the 30-30 club. Barry's dad, Bobby, did it five times. Five times. 30 home runs, 30 stolen bases. Bonds is one out of nine in the series. And a strike from Jackson is pitching extremely well. The pirate train roaring through the stadium. Jackson ahead on the count, and Bonds looks at it low. There's Barry. And his dad sweats it out. Probably more nervous now than he ever was when he was playing. One and one to the hitter. Two out. At second base, Jeff King, a leadoff single, and Jay Bell got a hit, and Slight flied out, and Bonilla popped up. Three and one. With two out, Jackson is not going to give in to this hitter. Even if he has to pitch to the next batter with the base is loaded. Three and one, 
two on, two out. Ball four. That's the third pass given by Jackson. And he would rather do that than give in to Bonds. He loads the bases. After ball four. <laughs> <laughs> Exhale, Bobby. And a visit to the mound. Base and loaded two out. The Pirates left the base and loaded in the fourth. And Pinello's talking to Jackson about pitching to Carmelo Martinez. He has Norm Charlton warmed up in the bullpen after Scudder had warmed up earlier. Tell you, Lou did something that if you're a catcher, you don't like. With the catcher and the pitcher right there, Lou asked the catcher how he was throwing. Yo, Joe Oliver said fine. You can see Danny Jackson saying five. You know, you try to build up that communication with the pitcher if you're a catcher, and you don't want to tell a manager that a pitcher's not throwing well while he's out there. Oh. I mean, you don't want to do that. You got to tell him behind his back. Oh, you got to, you got to <laughs> find a way. You know, if, if you're a manager, you got to ask the pitcher. You can't put a catcher in that situation and ask him how a pitcher's throwing. Got to ask the pitcher. Well, Martinez popped out his first time up and then doubled home a run in the fourth. Hit a double pass third. Base it loaded, two out. Pirates trailing by three. Ball one. Nice play by Oliver using that catcher's mitt like a first baseman's glove. Two singles and a walk have loaded them up. Two out. Popped it up. On the infield. And who wants it? Larkin takes charge. And the Pirates leave three more. They've left seven. Put the first two on. Failed to score. They trail by three. We'll return to Three River Stadium. After this word from your local station, it's 5 2 Cincinnati. We're back here at Three Rivers Stadium, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Third game of the National League playoff series. It's tied at a game apiece, but as we go into the sixth inning of this one, Cincinnati is on top by the score of 5 to 2. They've out hit the Pirates 8 6. Pittsburgh has left seven. They left the bases loaded in the last two innings. With your blimp overhead showing us those shots, and we're coming around to the business hour. Here's a home run by Billy Hatcher in the second, following a two out hit by Joe Oliver. The former Pirate player knocked one out of here for the first runs of the game. Pittsburgh came back to tie it, but with two on and one out in the fifth inning. The long ball struck again, and here we go into the sixth inning. First up, Lynn Braggs. Bill Landrum, the new pitcher, he pumps a strike in there. Braggs is one for two. Landrum, seven and three, and 13 saves during the season. He's a former member of the Cincinnati Club. Five to the Reds leading. One and one from Landry. See, this is one of those trap innings for Lou Pinella. Jim Leland's trying to get, by bringing in the right-hander, he wants Pinella to exchange Braggs and Joe Oliver, the third hitter in this inning. But a three-run lead negates that. The ball's foul off the bat of Braggs, one and two. That's why when you start a left-handed pitcher, then the manager, Lou Pinella in this case, has mostly right-handed hitters in there. So Jim Leland brings in the right-hander to get Lou to maybe change, put in a pinch hitter. But Lou's not biting because he's got a three-run lead. Tie ball game, you might see a change here. Looks like they're looking across a poker table at each other. 5-2, the Reds on top. See who has the best cards. Landrum, we used to pitch for the Reds and the Cubs, working for the Pirates here in the sixth. And he got it by him. Here's the biggest hit of this game, the two-on, one-out home run by Duncan in the fifth inning, and he really smashed it. This game being seen in 61 countries, including the Dominican Republic. 
I'll guarantee you they are dancing in the streets of San Pedro de Macariz. That's where Mariano Hales, along with a ton of other Major League Baseball talent. Now Benzinger is up. The switch hitter is one for two. And he skies it for Van Slyke. Can he get there? Yep, a good play. Two out. And Slyke can go get him. Takes a hit away from Benzinger. This ball had too much hang time. Todd hits it well, but Van Slyke with a good jump. And he makes a rather easy play out of it. Tell you, between Van, Van Slyke and Barry Bonds, you're not going to see a lot of balls fall in left center field. They can flat track them down. Oliver is singled and grounded into a double play. And Landrum gets a strike. We're in the top of the sixth. 5 2 Cincinnati. Popped it up to the right side for Jose Lee. Down go the Reds. 1 2 3. And Pittsburgh comes to bat in the bottom of the sixth inning. They trail 5 2. When you come to the Steel City of Pittsburgh, you can ride this Duquesne incline and have a look from this view. Coming down the side of the mountain, or rent yourself a blimp and take this look. Looking down from the Goodyear blimp, and looking up at the blimp. Bobby Bonilla on the bench. Wondering if his club can come back. They trail by three. He'll get another whack at it before it's over. There's our line score. Two home runs have accounted for all the Cincinnati runs. And Pittsburgh has twice left the bases loaded. Now they send up their number seven hitter, Don Slot. He's had a double. And he was given a walk. Had walk an intentional walk the last time up in the fourth inning to load the bases and with one out Jose lean struck out. That's the biggest pitch of this ball game for Danny Jackson the strike out of lean. Bases were loaded with one out at the time and Jackson gets ahead on the count here in the bottom of the sixth. Then they'll send up lean and then a pinch hitter so the Pirates will need another hitter. Out of play strike two. Danny Jackson with surgery on his left toe that put him out for last year when he came back this year he went on the disabled list three times and told me that one of the reasons was he was trying to do too much his toe gave him problems he tried to compensate and ended up hurting his shoulder they thought initially it was a rotator cuff injury but he went out the next day he said I'm going to prove the doctors wrong he did and that's why he came back in September. And as you see today, he is throwing exceptionally well. Very miffed at the writers for asking him questions about his physical well-being. 0-2 oh, to the batter, a broken bat ground ball to Sable. Have plenty of time, and he gets the first out. Now let's go down to James Brown with Bobby Bonds. All right, Jack, thank you very much. Obviously, your son's having a little difficult time right now. One for nine in the series up to this point. Have you said anything to him at all? What have you noticed he hasn't been doing? Well, you know, this is the first time I've watched him live. You know, watch him on TV, and and, and today it looked like he's just pressing a little bit. Uh, looked like he's uh, grabbing the bat a little bit uh, too tight, and he's just a little bit tense. So I, I'm going to talk to him afterwards to try to get him uh, to relax just a little bit. Jose Lean hits it fair past third, and that'll be a one-out double here in the sixth inning. Pirates are specializing in two base hits today. That's their fourth. Lean to saying, why didn't I do that with the base and loaded? I was thinking the same thing. Timing is everything. And here Jose Lean rifles one by Chris Sabo at third base. As Jack said, the fourth double of the game. But he was called out on strikes the last time up. The base is loaded and one out. He would love to exchange that. It would be a tight ball game. At the time he was called out, the score was two to two, bases loaded and only one out. He took the call, strike three, and then Zane Smith tapped back to Danny Jackson. 
And we're going to have a pinch hitter for Bill Landrum who pitched one perfect inning with a strikeout along the way. And that brings a visit to the mound by the pitching coach. Gary Reedus is going to pinch hit and Jackson's visited by Stan Williams. And Williams is going to make the pitching change. Stan Williams and Lou Pinella waiting until Gary Reedus was announced and now they're going to go to the right hander Rob Dibble. So Dibble follows Jackson to the mound one on one out. Danny Jackson pitched well five and a third two runs seven hits struck out five walked three one intentionally he gives way to Rob Dibble who now makes his second appearance in the playoff. He was eight and three with 11 saves during the regular season. And we have more from James Brown. All right Jack back with Bobby Bonds the father of Barry Barnes. You were describing to me what Barry should be doing differently with his swinging position. Show us that. Well you know I'm watching him right now and right through here you can see where he's gripping the bat so tight he actually has ripples right near his, in his arm. And uh, if, if you have these ripples, that shows me that you're really tense. So basically, I got to have him just loosen up. Start off with the bat loose in his hand. When he swings and approaches the ball, he'll take the natural strength grip and hit the ball. But right now, he's almost like choking a baseball bat. And as Tim McCarver said, that comes from a man 30 35 consecutive years back upstairs. There's Barry on the bench. And on the mound, making his third playoff appearance in as many games is the fireballer, Ron Dibble. First up against him is Gary Reedus. Big swing and strike one. You might wonder why Jim Leland isn't employing a left-handed hitter when the Pirates still trail by one or by three. And Jeff King's on deck. If Reedus gets on, you can expect a guy like Sid Bream or somebody like that, Wally Backman, to pinch hit for Jeff King. One and one to Reedus. Reedus usually has a good batting eye. He can be a dangerous hitter and occasionally hit the long ball. Not very often. Though. This is a bad matchup, though. You, but he had, he was already announced. That's why Devil was brought in the game. He couldn't reach that one. One and two. Reedus had six home runs during the season. And strikeouts are the norm whenever Dibble is pitching. He digs a better hole in front of the pitching rubber. We are in the bottom of the sixth. One on, one out. The five two Cincinnati lead. One and two to Reedus. Former Cincinnati player. Just missed. Two and two. I don't think Reedus could have swung at that if he wanted to. Two and two. It's Bell and been well documented about this pitcher, Rob Dibble. He wants to be a closer someplace or be paid more money by the Reds. Three and two. They will walk people occasionally and then come back and strike them out. That was a slider. Joe Oliver just hanging on. Don't have much time to react when Dibble's pitching. Three and two. Leaned at second, one out. Struck him out. That's the second out of the hit. Boy, that guy is something. He is something. He can blow. Good old fashioned heart ball right here. Like baseball, you used to plan the pasture. High heat. You know, these uh, radar guns have a lot of variables in there, but the gun that we just used said 99 miles per hour on that pitch. The batter is Jeff King, one for three. On the inside corner, that ball moved. That's 44 miles over the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> that ball really jumped from Dibble, stayed on the corner. Leaned at second, two out. The Pirates have already stranded seven. That's strike two. Pittsburgh left the base and loaded in the fourth, put the first two on in the fifth, and never did score. Left the base and loaded. And a one out double here. They wasted a leadoff double in the third. So they have missed some chances. What are you thinking, Mr. Dibble? That 
to rub up that pelote. You're going to waste one. Are you going to try to get him right here? Oh, and two, two out. That's the answer to that question. Two strikeouts for Dibble, who just came into the game, and now Pittsburgh has left eight, and they trail five two. We go into the seventh inning and let's look back at a National League championship moment from game five, 1972. Here's a one one pitch. And a wild pitch in the ninth inning. And George Foster scored the winning run. And that nailed down the title for the Reds in 1972. Bob Moose, the pitcher, and Hal McCray was the hitter. And John Smiley's the new pitcher, the third pitcher of the day for the Pirates, his first appearance in the League Championship Series. He'll work in the seventh inning to the Cincinnati Ball Club and Billy Hatcher. Hatcher batting in the number eight spot. He bunts the ball. Tough play for Smiley. Couldn't get it out of the glove. Hatcher, who had a double and a home run previously, bunts safely to start the seventh inning. And the reason right-handed hitters try to bunt against left-handed pitchers is left-handers fall toward the third base line. Watch Smiley. And it takes him a long time to unravel. And now he tries to shovel pass that never develops. So the third hit of the day for Billy Hatcher. He's homered, doubled, and single. And Smiley is greeted with that bunt single which is the ninth hit for the Reds. And now Dibble will try to get the ball down. And takes a strike from Smiley who would like the strike out, but you have to watch Hatcher in the running department. The runner over at first base, Billy Hatcher, swiped 30 bases this year. So if Smiley is careless, he'll take off. Dibble bunts it to third. The play will be to second by King. He got him. Now Dibble will run the bases with one out. The play went 1-6. But it too hard. Five, Jeff six, King. Excuse me. Uh huh. Jeff King makes the play to second base. And you see Jay Bell sometimes a shortstop or a second baseman they take on the posture of a first baseman and that's what Jay Bell was doing right there just making sure of the lead runner. Well here's your favorite play they put a jacket on Rob Dibble running the bases at first 80 degrees and Rob Dibble's going to put the jacket on one of the more overrated things in this grand game. And the first baseman Martinez will play behind Dibble with one out here in the seventh. The batter is Larkin, one for three. First pitch a strike from Smiley. Bob Gibson used to say, hey, when you're on base, you become a base runner. You're no longer a pitcher. And how many base runners do you see wearing warm-up jackets? Smiley has been a starter for the Pirates most of the time. This is low and away. Martinez playing behind Devil, of course. I mean, Devil, a relief pitcher, he's not going anywhere. Martinez then moving into the hole in case Larkin spanks it that way. One one pitch has popped up and that should be the second out leaned is under it. And that's the second out Well, tonight on CBS. Premier programming commences with Uncle Buck no relation <laughs> followed by Major Dad no relation. And then some fine programming the 24th annual Country Music Association Awards all of that tonight on CBS. Where's Uncle Buck? Uncle Buck. Uncle Jack. <laughs> Runner at first, two out. Fly ball into left field, down the line, and curving foul at the last moment off the bat of Duncan. Duncan's 
Pirates are thinking has done enough damage today. He hit a three run one out home run in the fifth inning to mark the difference in this game. It's five two. Gets out in front here the ball down and in. And hits it into the Reds bullpen. There it is clear out guys and see they clear out. Nobody's there. to Smiley to hold the Reds right where they are. And the Pirates have the tough task of trying to break through against Dibble or maybe Charlton or maybe Myers. Line drive and another base hit for Duncan. He's two for four. Dibble stops at second. Well and the sacrifice worked in this inning. That would have been another run for Cincinnati. Instead they're two on two out. Perez talking with Duncan. Fired fans are unhappy. Duncan, by the way, used to be a switch hitter when he was with the Dodgers, and he says that hitting primarily as a right-handed batter, he rarely switch hits anymore. But when you're hitting right-handed all the time, you do become more comfortable against left-handed pitching. That's been the big difference in his average this year, batting over 400 against left-handers. They boys one for three. Strike on the inside corner. Fine pitch from John Smiley. Four out of 17 during his career against this pitcher for Chris. The Reds have left only two. The Pirates have left eight. Welcome back. Pop fly into center. Van Sly got there for the Now the Reds leave two and they've left four. It's seventh inning stretch time here in Pittsburgh. Cincinnati with two home runs has the lead five to two. CBS Sports coverage of game three of the 1990 National League Championship Series is brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. The employee owners of Avis, we're trying harder than ever. And by Budweiser, the king of beers. Remember, no when to say when. Rush hour in downtown Pittsburgh. We're looking at the Golden Triangle. The tallest buildings are the USX Tower and the PPG, the Pittsburgh Plate Gas, Plate Glass Building. And a look at the Ohio River. Downtown Pittsburgh. Ironically, that's been the problem today for the Pirates. Two guys with the Cincinnati Reds have gone downtown for all five runs. Those pictures from the Goodyear Blimp America. Here we are into the bottom of the seventh inning. Pittsburgh Pirates, when trailing after six innings this year, were five and 53. Only the St. Louis Cardinals and the Chicago Cubs had worse records. That's when they were trailing after six innings. They're five and 53. So against this Reds bullpen, it does not look good for the Buckos. They trail 5-2, and Jay Bell leads it off. He's had a single and a double. And he's had four hits in the playoff. And he hits it to Larkin. And there is one gone on the throat of Ben Singer. You get something to swing at against. Dibble, you might as well. Although some would say trailing by three ought to give Dibble a chance to walk in. Bell went for the first one. That's one way this game has changed considerably. Yeah, that that particular style of play is passe now in baseball. 15 years ago, if you're trailing by more than one run, where your home run with the bases empty doesn't mean anything. If you were trailing by more than one, you take a strike. Not so anymore. And slight ball one. He has walked twice. He's fly to left. He wonder if he'll be able to pull the ball against Dibble, who has retired three in a row in relief of Danny Jackson. All right at the beginning of the day, we talked about defense, and Lou Pinella told us that's the first thing he thinks about when he makes out a lineup card. He said any offense you get is gravy. What you have to do is stop the other team from scoring. Defense or good pitching really shored up by good defense. And Slyke with one out. Strike two. Over in Cincinnati in the ninth inning of the second game, we saw some sparkling play from Barry Larkin at short. And Larkin has 
take care of the first down in this inning. One and one the count. And it's like flinched and it's a strike. One and two. Foul ball keeps Van Slyke up there. One and two with one out. Dibble retired the first two that he faced on strikes in the sixth. That got Bell on a ground ball. He's working up a sweat here in the seventh inning. That's the same guy who had his jacket on running the base. <laughs> He's not warm. <laughs> one and two. The third strikeout for Dibble. I know you Cincinnati fans would like to see that work by Barry Larkin in the ninth inning the other day. Barry Bonds leading off the game, a one run ball game, two to one. And look at this play by Larkin. That's a wow. Barry Bonds thought it was going to be a base hit. Then he made a rather fine play for the second out. It was the Barry Larkin show in the ninth at Cincinnati as they won their first game. Dibble with the bases empty, two out to Bonilla. High fly ball, playable for Davis. And in the seventh, the Pirates go down in order, and Dibble is set down five in a row. Now we played seven innings. Reds still lead 5 2. Just past 5:30 uh, local time here, and the Goodyear blimp shows you the outline of the football field that was used yesterday here. And right after the Steelers defeated San Diego, the ground crew went to work. They worked till seven o'clock this morning getting this field ready for baseball. And it takes us into the eighth inning. And the first pitch is popped foul and out of play by Eric Davis. Chased by Slot, nothing doing. The pitcher is Smiley. And our friends upstairs in the Goodyear blimp showing us the pretty pictures of Pittsburgh and the rivers and the ballpark. See the football field there. It's a funny thing. The Pirates and the and the Steelers were both working out here on Saturday, and the Steelers were working on their on their kickoff return. And Andy Van Slyke went up to one of the guys. He said, "What are you working on that for? You don't have an offensive touchdown on here." <laughs> but they did yesterday. Yeah. Right. Came out of it, came off the snide yesterday. And Eric Davis is almost on a snide. He is 0 for 3 today with two strikeouts, and he's 1 for 10. Facing John Smiley, and a pop fly, and a play for Slot. And he makes the catch. And Eric Davis is going down too easily as far as Cincinnati fans are concerned. He's 0 for 4 and 1 for 11. Trading baseball cards, I believe. Where's the bubble gum? Probably in his mouth. No. Nope. And hat doesn't fit that kid, does it? No. <laughs> okay, it teaching is. the kid how to trade those cards. Yeah. Now at the plate, it's Glenn Braggs. And strike one to him from Smiley, who is in his second inning of work, following Zane Smith. And Bill Landrum to the mound. I said a kickoff return. The Steelers were practicing their kickoffs the other day. Andy Van Slyke said, why are you practicing your kickoffs? You haven't scored an offensive touchdown yet. <laughs> He's a funny guy. One ball, one strike. Saw some clips of Barry Bonds throwing the football. Like a left-handed option quarterback. Boomer Esiason. Braggs hits it up the middle. There's Jose Lee. He's always waiting for the ball. Well, he has some range. Got over there in a hurry. Two out. Broke the bat and grounded out to second. Braggs one for four on the day and in the playoff. Tell you, these Reds are a different team against left-handed pitching. All of their hits today, they're 10 for 28 against left-handers today. They led the National League in hitting, 280 average. They are a different ball club against left handed pitching. That's why I'm sure Jim Leland wants a good performance out of Bob Walk tomorrow night and Doug Drabeck on Wednesday. And the pitchers tomorrow night are going to be the first two who started Bob Walk and Jose Rijo. We have 
the double dip tomorrow here on CBS American League National League. Benzinger hits it to lean. That's all for Cincinnati in the eighth. Now the Pirates trailing by three, five to two. Five to two will send up Bonds to lead it off. Eighth inning, and as we look back at this game, we see that the Pirates left the bases loaded in the fourth and the fifth, and they have stranded eight. And Mariano Duncan's three-run homer in the fifth inning was the big one. Two on and one out at the time. Billy Hatcher hit a two-run homer in the second, and it's 5-2. And a new pitcher. Norm Charlton was the loser in relief in the first game, and he takes over in the eighth inning with an eye toward retiring. Barry Bonds, who leads it off, he's 0 for 2 and 1 for 9. All one to him from Charlton. Charlton was a starter, then they put him in the bullpen, 12 and 9 on the year, two saves. Bonds chased the low pitch, and Duncan missed him at first. Now the Pirates get their leadoff man on. Bonds a 304 hitter against left handers this year the ball hits the heel of the glove of Mariano Duncan bounces up and once the ball bounces out of that glove you can forget about getting Barry Bonds too fast and a base hit in case you're wondering about the ruling the eighth hit of the day for Pittsburgh Charlton has a pretty fair move for a left hander I'm surprised they're holding him on eighth inning they've got a three run lead of course, Bonds will run any time. That's where baseball has changed. And Martinez doesn't hit the ball that way a lot. Martinez one for three. Strike to him. Martinez popped to first. He doubled home a run of the fourth, and then he popped out with a base that loaded in the fifth. Carmelo used to be with the Cubs, the Padres, the Phils this year. The other clubs before this year. He went around and he's quickly in the hole on two. Notice the Reds don't have either their shortstop or their second baseman cheating at second base. The double play would be nice here, but they're playing for one out. When you got a three run lead in the eighth, you want one. Not two. There's one right there as Martinez fans. So Charlton, after giving up the hit to Bonds, gets Martinez. Turned that ball over a little bit, didn't he? Looked like it. Good location. It did have a little action away from Martinez. Good location right on the outside corner. One on, one out for Don Slot. He's had a double and given a walk. One for two. First pitch low. And once again, Lou Pinella's playing for one out. There are a lot of teams that don't do that. Duncan is straight away at second base. Larkin is straight away at shortstop. They're not cheating for the double play. See Duncan away from second. Larkin the same at short. And the pitch goes low ball too. They'll take the double play if it comes their way, but they're not playing out of position to try to get it. That's right. They're not cheating the second baseman towards second base. They're playing straight up and making sure they get one out. Pretty picture here at Three River Stadium. And Slot hit it foul. Two and one. We have a doubleheader tomorrow on CBS, live at 3 Eastern Time, Game 3 between Boston and the Oakland A's. And then the second part of the twin bill tomorrow night at 8 Eastern for Game 4 of this series between Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. That's tomorrow on CBS. These Pirate fans hungry for a rally. Bonds at first, one out. Dropped a strike in there, two and two. You can see that Charlton hasn't thrown over to first. He's not that concerned with Bonds. Leading by three, five to the score here in the eighth. He wants to get it out. Bonds might just run on his own, but he's not going. And it just missed. Three and two. Getting late for 
Pittsburgh, eighth inning. And in order to win, they have to break through this Cincinnati bullpen. That's ball four, and the tying run will come to the plate. The fourth walk given to the Pirates today. You mentioned that Oakland ball club, they dominated the Red Sox in those two games at Fenway. I guess everybody in baseball is thinking, can they be beaten? I tell you, they can beat you in a lot of ways. Starting pitching, bullpen, defense, the long ball, the average, the stolen base. What do you need? They have it. Jose leaned us up. He is one for three. Pirates have already stranded eight runners. Two on, one out, and a strike to Jose. Chico, they call. He struck out with the base that loaded and one out in the fourth inning of this game, one of the big outs of the game. Get a home run in game two over in Cincinnati. And Charlton with a spin move to keep Bonds close. You can do that to second base. You can't do that to first base when you're on the rubber. Lean. Ball one low. One and one. Big spot here for Pittsburgh. Lead off. Single by Bonds. An infield hit. Then a walk. Pitcher due up next. Smiley's in the on deck circle, but of course they'll pinch hit. Pirates trail by three. Lean was late. One and two. Charlton after Dibble. Fastballs followed by more fastballs. Looked like the catcher wanted that pitch up, didn't he? Mm -hmm. One and two into third base. Out at second. Safe at first. Gets away. And a run scores. It's five to three. And Duncan really didn't have much of a chance to complete the double play. Well, that's because they were playing straight away. Once again, you do take that chance. Duncan had a long way to go to second base. He wasn't cheating as he normally would, especially with Jose Lean batting. Lean has that inclination to go the other way. So because of that, Duncan probably should have held the ball. But he elects to go to first off balance. Even a good throw doesn't have Lean, but the bad throw scores Bonds. In between hops, skips by Bensinger, and Bond scores easily. It took Duncan a long time to get to the base. We're going to have a pinch hitter. Dying run will be at the plate in the person of R.J. Reynolds. Go back for Smiley. Here in the eighth. Smiley pitched two shutout innings. And ball one. First, lead swiped eight bases. This pinch hitting role has been the primary role for R.J. Reynolds all year. He's a switch hitter. Had eight pinch hits during the season. Knows the strikes on him. He takes ball two. Five three. The Pirates have closed the gap. An error by Duncan was the first error of the game. They're two out. Two balls, no strikes to RJ. All three. Charlton is opening the door. Speaking of opening the door, that's exactly what RJ Reynolds was glad he could do Saturday. After being, he was driving his Corvette to the workout, and he was rear-ended. His head went a bit against the dash. He had a headache, a sore back. So he is lucky that he could open the door after that crash coming to his workout on Saturday. But he is A-OK. All right, first two out, three and over the batter. Right, three and one. 
Let's see if we get any action out of the Pirates here. Probably not in the running department. This is the first inning of work for Charlton. He's given up a hit and a walk. Runner not going. And he swung at it, says the umpire. Or it was in the strike zone, three and two. Just caught the outside corner. As you see, Joe Oliver outside, and that ball was indeed a strike. Benzinger drops behind Lean to a go with the pitch. He's at first, two out. Runner going. Popped up. Battle in the eighth. Sabo under it. And it was a fair ball as he caught it. And the inning is over. But the Pirates get one run on one hit, one error, one left. They've left nine and after eight. They trail 5-3. We started the day tied at a game apiece, and the Reds carry a 5 3 lead into the ninth. And from up above, a look at the stadium. Now, a close up look at Stan Belinda and his teammates call him Opie. He doesn't like that nickname, but they think he looks like Ron Howard. I don't blame him for not looking. <laughs> For not liking it. If I looked like Ron Howard when he was a kid, I wouldn't like it either. He looks better Look now. Look at Opie. Opie's not. No, I, I wouldn't like that either. Here we go. Into the ninth <laughs> inning with Belinda, and he gives up a base hit to Joe Oliver. He won't try for two against Bonds. Bonds had that ball to second about the time Oliver got to first, but for Joe Oliver, his second hit of the day. Ron Howard, however, has turned out to be a real good looking guy. Don't try to make up. <laughs> I heard you. We heard you. This fastball to Joe Oliver lined to left field. So his second hit of the day and the first hit off a right hander today for the Reds. And we're going to have a runner for Oliver. And it's going to be Bates. Bates is the one thrown out by LaVaglier the other day in game two. Or in game one. First and second, one out. Eric Davis took off for third. I don't know whether Chris Sabo is saying that's it for me or it for my bat. <laughs> and let's see what the batter does. Hatcher, Billy Hatcher has singled, doubled, and hit a two-run homer. Is he bunting here in the ninth? That's what you'd expect. Or a hit and run. Bates the runner. At your bunting foul. Billy Hatcher put the Reds on top in the second inning with this two run shot. Joe Oliver was on ahead of Billy. A two run homer, a three run homer by Mariano Duncan, and that has been it for the Reds. They have a two run lead here in the ninth. I'd like to get this runner all the way around. Bates with a lead, nobody out. And then just steps off. With Hatcher bunning there, you would assume that Lou Pinello will be pinch hitting for Norm Charlton, who's on deck. Nobody's warming, however, for the Reds right now. The pitch missed outside, although Randy Myers warmed up early. So it won't take him long to get ready. I think Jeff Reed's coming in from the bullpen. So maybe Randy Myers is ready, but there's no one presently warming up for the Reds. And if that's the case, unless you're going to take Charlton out of the game, why are you bunting here? Leadoff man is on. Melinda steps off. A base hit by Oliver. Bates is running for him. And Hatcher is at the dish. He's at three of the 11 Cincinnati hits. It's bunted in the air, and that's the first down of the inning. Boy, a manager hates to have something like that happen. Martinez made the catch as Hatcher bunted the ball too hard. Gets the bat head under the ball, and an easy play for Martinez. 
So Jeff Reed now is going to be the pinch hitter since he's going to come in in the now it's going to be Hal Morris. Hmm. Reed's in the game already. Lou Pinella, we've talked about it. He does have the luxury of carrying only nine pitchers, nine durable pitchers. So he does have two more extra players than Jim Leland has. Norm Charlton is being lifted. He pitched one inning, one run, one hit, one strikeout, one walk. And Randy Myers will work the bottom of this ninth inning. Al Morris is up, one on, one out. Morris in the playoffs is one for four. Had a terrific season for Cincinnati. And he follows it to the screen. It's very unusual for nobody to be up in the Reds bullpen. Randy Myers had warmed up earlier, but he just threw a few pitches. There he goes. There you are. On cue. He'll work the ninth. It won't take him many pitches to be ready. He's loose, isn't he? In more ways than one. He's smiling, laughing, talking, jabbering. Bates the runner at first, being held by Martinez. There goes the runner, and it's a perfect hit and run, and it's going to result in a base hit. And Bell did a good job of getting back to knock the ball down and prevent the runner from going to third. So Pinella does some running and it pays off. Otherwise, that would have been a double play. Well, sometimes you have the wrong guy covering. Jay Bell is covering on this play. Had it been the other way around and Jose Leand had been covering, could be a double play or at least one out. But Leand is playing Morris to pull, so it would make sense that Bell would be covering. And he makes a nice recovery there to prevent Bill Bates going to third base. So instead of first and third, it's first and second. It was a nice play by Bell. He re recovered nicely. And there is one out, and Larkin is up, and he could blow this one open for the Reds, who lead by two. 5-3 Cincinnati, ninth inning, two on, and one out. Belinda in trouble in his first inning of work. Larkin has had a hit one for four. Ball one to him. Larkin drove home 67 runs during the regular season. None in the playoffs thus far. The Pirates and Belinda would like the double play. The Reds and Larkin would like a base hit to increase their margin. Two on, one out. The spin move for the Pirates. It will be the top of the order in the ninth inning against Randy Myers. First, we have the Cincinnati ninth. Belinda <laughs> followed Zane Smith to the mound. And Landrup, Smiley, Smith gave up all five Cincinnati runs. Larkin pops it up for the second out of the inning. Bonds will take care of it. Always one hands the ball, and there are two out. In the Pirate bullpen, the left hander is Bob Kipper, and now uh, another left hander, Bob Patterson, joins him. Ted Power is sitting and watching. Pirates have 11 pitchers on their playoff roster. Cincinnati has nine. We're at Three Rivers Stadium. Pittsburgh, ninth inning, two on, two out. The score, 5-3 Cincinnati. There's the line score. The Reds have hit two home runs. Here is a half swing, and the batter held up. Duncan, he's had a single and a home run. That's runner the umpire said he didn't swing. Almost all replays look like hitters go around too far. I think Dutch was right there. He didn't go. He didn't think so? No, nope. neither did Dutch. He's the one who counts. <laughs> two on, two out. And ball one to the batter, Duncan. Ball two from Stan Belinda. You obviously disagree. I mean, 
Well, Jim Leland didn't get too upset about it. I thought he did go across the plate, but it doesn't matter. A little too far. There are the Pirates down by a couple. Sid Breen with a bat in his hands. He might be batting in the ninth inning. And the catcher, Slot, goes to the mound to talk it over. Here comes Ray Miller. We're in the gloaming here in Pittsburgh. The game started after 3 o'clock local time. Now we're a little after 6. These Reds would like very much to get more, and Belinda's job is to keep it a two-run game and give the top of the order a chance at it in the bottom of the ninth. King, Bell, and Van Slyke, unless they go to Bream or Lavalier or some of the other left-handed hitters they have. It's funny how baseball popularizes some words. I bet nobody would ever even use the word gloaming had Gabby Hart not hit the home run in the gloaming when 1938, 52 years ago, about this time of year. You're right about that. Two on, two out, two balls, no strikes to Duncan. Duncan has the big hit today, a three-run homer in the fifth. Billy Hatcher hit a two-run homer in the second, and the Reds have never been behind. Cincinnati tied it in the fourth. The Pirates tied it in the fourth, and the Reds regained the lead in the fifth. Duncan lines one, and it's a base hit. Bates will come to the plate, and Vance Light's throw is... Too late and another run for Cincinnati and the man over to third. The third hit of the day for Duncan. He's driven in four of the six Cincinnati runs. Bates, the pinch runner, scores. Don't overlook that move by Pinella. And it is a 6-3 game. And don't overlook how Morris pinch hitting for Norm Charlton. Morris with an infield hit. Bates was the pinch runner. So Lou Pinella tried to get another one. He got at least one. And between Duncan and Billy Hatcher, they have driven in all six runs for the Reds today. The throw by Van Slyke is high toward the third baseline. A nice play by Don Slott, but on the play, Morris goes to third and Bates scores easily. Bates put the shoulder down. He wasn't going to be deterred. Van Slyke really didn't have much of a chance to throw him out. He gave it a try, and it's first and third, two out. And a breaking ball. Strike one to the batter, Chris Sabo. At third base, the runner is Hal Morris. Duncan, with his third hit of the day, is perched at first. And there's the score, 6-3. Ball high to Sabo. Sabo one for four. And two out of 11 in the three games. Well, the Pirates thought they were out of it, perhaps, when Larkin flied to left. But Duncan nailed him. Pitches ball two. Cincinnati got five runs off the starter, Zane Smith, and now one off Belinda, who had pitched two perfect innings in another game. Sabo hits it foul back here. Two and two. The Reds have banged out 13 hits. They've out hit the Pirates 13 to 8. I think somebody going after that foul ball right above us dropped a shoe or an umbrella. I guess the other shoe dropped. <laughs> oh, it's an umbrella. There it is. <laughs> Looked like a shoe? <laughs> yeah. Another, another umbrella dropped. We're waiting for the other umbrella to drop. Two and two the count. Two on, two out, two balls, two strikes. Runner goes from first, and a strikeout ends the inning. But a big run for the Reds on three hits. They leave two. They have left six. We're into the bottom of the ninth, and the visitors have the lead, six to three. You know, the purists say that you don't make one-handed catches. You may or may not know that it's proper technique when an outfielder is fielding a ground ball to use one hand to bring the glove to the shoulder and then throw. And you just saw it from one of the finest outfielders in the major leagues. Well, now the crowd gets into it here as their ball club trails by three. There's Van Slyke. 
Pirates do it, they say. The Pirates, as we showed you, have not been good at coming from behind, and they're going to have to try it against one of the best relievers in the game. First of all, the catcher is Jeff Reed. After Oliver got the hit, they pitch ran for him. Now the pitcher is Randy Myers, who had 31 saves during the season. Jeff King's the batter in ball one. This is the second playoff appearance for Myers. He gave one walk in an inning and two thirds in the second game, which Cincinnati won. He finished the game. King is one for four. And that's a strike. It's one and one. These two teams split during the season. Six wins, six losses. But Cincinnati won four out of six in this part. And a foul ball carries into the stands. As Myers came chasing over. He expected a big gust of wind to blow the ball back to him. That's Myers for you. He applies himself. Well, he's a tenacious competitor, and he was traded for a tenacious competitor. You don't see many pitchers near the near the dugout. Open the gate, Randy said. Oh, baby, don't go running in here. The reason that that trade was made, the Mets needed a left-hander that threw ground balls. Randy Myers is not a ground ball pitcher, and he fits in very well with Rob Dibble and Norm Charlton. Myers was a short man who could go on his own and did this year the relief man of the year. Jeff King took a strike. He went around according to the plate umpire Paul Rungi. That's the first out here in the ninth inning. King apparently didn't think that he had swung the bat. That's the first out in the ninth. Well you saw Mariano Duncan almost go around and now Jeff King's probably saying hey I didn't go around any more than Duncan did. Just about the same. About the same, yeah. One was a strike, the other wasn't. Myers has retired the first man, and the Pirates need two runners to have a chance. They trail 6 3. And the batter, Jay Bell, takes a strike as he should after showing the bunt. We're tied at a game apiece. This is the third game. And we'll see who gets the edge. On the corner and that's strike two. Randy got the edge on that one, the edge of the outside corner. He did. Say so. when you throw that hard and you live on the edge like Randy can. I mean he's he's a control pitcher along with a guy who throws hard. And he struck him out on the outside part with a fastball. Second out of the inning. See this pitch is not on the fat part of the plate. It's right on the edge. Randy Myers continues to live on the edge. And now the Pirates with two out and nobody on, trailing by three in the ninth. We'll have the left handed batter, Van Slyke, up there. Andy has walked. He's 0 for 3. Ball one. He's two out of 11 in the playoff. Jackson. Dibble, Charlton Myers, they used all three of the nasties today. There's a strike. Two out in the bottom of the ninth inning. Like trying to wheedle his way on base somehow. Tony and Barnes to follow. Long fly ball in the right, curving and going foul. Keeps the score 6 3. The coordinating producer. Major League Baseball on CBS is Rick Lasavita. Today's telecast directed by Joe Assetti, pregame show produced by Ed Gorn, directed by Duke Struck. Senior producer David Winner, executive producer of CBS Sports is Ted Shaker, and the Reds lead two games to one. And Randy Myers struck out the side. Hard shot likes that. Van Slyke end of the day, 0 for 4. And the Reds come into this ballpark and win it by the score. Of six to three. 
Pittsburgh Pirates left nine and that made the big difference in the game. Cincinnati left six. They popped the long ball Hatcher and Duncan with the home runs. And the Reds are on top two games to one after Lee after winning today six to three. We'll have some interviews coming your way. Final score back here at Three Rivers Stadium. Cincinnati Reds take it six to three. And I'm standing here with two of the heroes of the game to my left, Billy Hatcher, and to my right, Mariano Duncan. And let me start with you first. Both of you guys, all six runs accounted for by you guys. Now, I thought the big hitters were supposed to be the other guys. What's happening? Well, you know, Lou just told us, you know, we got to make something happen. And uh, Mariano, he's been hitting lefties all year very, very hard. So, you know, I'm just trying to get on base, batting eighth. And today was just one of those days that was me and Mariano's day. You made a comment to me in Cincinnati about the kind of pressure you play with in the second half of the season, and certainly you look awfully loose out here today. Yeah, it's fun. You know, you play a 162-game schedule. That's when it's the toughest. When you get into the playoffs, you have fun because you're playing the same team seven games. You only have to concentrate on that team, so, you know, it makes it a lot fun. Last question. Game 6, 1986 National League Championship Series, Houston against the Mets. You hit a home run in the 14th inning to tie it up. Was that home run bigger than this one or this one today? Well, that one in, in the 14th, I wanted to beat the Mets really, really bad, you know. That was probably the best thing that ever happened to me as far as playing baseball because it was a, it was a thrill I'd never forget. I mean, running around the bases, the people in the Astrodome were just going crazy. I, I was nervous. I was shaking when I sat down because I really didn't know what I had done until the next day after we had lost. All right, congratulations on an outstanding Thank you. Game. All right. All right, let's turn around to Mariano Duncan. San Pedro, DeMarco, Reese down in the Dominican Republic. Some yeah, outstanding ball players from down there. Yeah, that's a lot of good ball players, but, uh, you know, first of all, you know, uh, I'm very happy that kind of game what I have today because, you know, I want to show to the to the fan and I show to a lot of people that then, like the people say, that the, the Eric Davis is supposed to cure the team. They, you know, I don't say nothing bad in particular about Eric Davis, you know, but they're supposed to be the whole team. The night guy that Luke put in the lineup, we're supposed to go into the field and do the best. You know, I don't want the Eric, you know, put a person in himself thinking about it, that he want to cure the team. I don't want him to think, to think that way because they're supposed to be the whole team. Well, all right. Well, you definitely took a lot of pressure off of Eric Davis and a lot of people. Walk us through what the home run pitch was like and when you knew it was definitely out of here. Walk us through that slowly. Well, you know, the, the soon when I hit the ball, you know, I, hit, I know what I hit the ball very well, but I don't think that I want to go out of the ballpark. You know, but I'm run, when I'm running for first and second, when I see Barry Bonds, you know, go after the ball, I say, that's out of there, you know, and they make me the happy man in the world. So you slowed up a little bit and took yeah. a nice hero yeah. trot. Yeah, I did slow down, and then I enjoyed my home run. All right, Mariano Duncan, congratulations. Thank you very much. All right, let's go back upstairs to Jack Buck and Tim McCarver. The Chevrolet player of the game in Mariano Duncan. Oh, you got me talking too fast. Of uh, the Cincinnati Reds, Chevrolet will donate $1,000 in his behalf to the Special Olympics. Two singles, a three-run homer, four RBIs, no doubt that Duncan was the MVP. I guess Jim? the caption on today's game should Don't be Donuts and Eggs. Duncan and Hatcher, all six runs driven in by Duncan and Hatcher, four by Mariano and two by Billy. I doubt that Pat O'Brien will comment on that remark, but Good. Pat will be along here in a moment. <laughs> Cincinnati won it 6-3, they lead two games to one. Pat O'Brien back in our New York studios. Uh, reminded that tomorrow, Game 3 of the American League Championship Series, Boston at Oakland, the A's lead the, game, uh, lead the series two games to none. Now, the Red Sox flew all night uh, last night and arrived in the Oakland area about 7 o'clock this morning. You can see all the reporters down there. They traveled with them. And our reporter, Jim Gray, is out there somewhere with the skipper. Jim? Thank you very much, Pat. I am here with manager Joe Morgan. Long night for you, Joe. The mental health of your team having come off two disappointing losses and then flying all night. Someone says Burks is hurt. I know nothing about it. The trainers know nothing about it. Yesterday it was Clemens out for the year. Well, there's nothing to that either, so I can't tell you anything. As far as I know, we're all set. What about your team's mental attitude, though? There's so much disappointment. Roger not getting the victory, and then last night, you having said we have to win last night's game probably to be in this series. Where does that leave your team now going into game three? Well, it leaves us that we have to win tomorrow, then. That's it. And the next day, and get four wins out of it. Mike Boddicker tomorrow night. He would be your number two man usually. You think you have an advantage using Boddicker over more? Well, I don't know about more, but Bartica certainly pitches very few bad games. He won 10 in a row this year, had a little letdown, and then came back like gangbusters the last month and a half. So he gives you an outstanding effort every time out there. You'd never know you're down 2-0. Oh, you're very calm here. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. The first pitch is tomorrow, and we go get him from there. 
Okay, thank you very much, Joe Morgan. Good luck tomorrow night. We'll be here tomorrow afternoon, that is, on CBS. Let's go back to Pat O'Brien. All right, Jim, thank you. Uh, skipper, thank you. And calm indeed. We go from one reporter to another reporter, one skipper to another skipper. Let's go back uh, to Pittsburgh and JB. James? All right, Pat. I'm standing here, of course, with uh, Lou Pinella. I guess a number of decisions you had to make tactically throughout the game, one of which perhaps was when to pull Danny Jackson, given the historical shoulder problems, but uh, paid off well. Well, he threw about 80-some uh, pitches a day. He had good stuff for uh, most of the ball game. And in the fifth inning, uh, with Carmelo Martinez up uh, and the bases loaded, uh, I had a decision to make. Uh, uh, basically, if I had pulled Danny then, uh, I would have brought in another left-hander, Charlton, to face uh, Martinez instead of going with the right-hander because they would have had Bream sitting on the bench coming in to pinch hit. So, But Danny did a great job for us, and I'd like to give all our starters as much leeway as I can, especially in the fifth inning because it's their ball game to win or lose in. This looks like it's getting to be a little regular occurrence here, you and I. Well, I'd like to be with you a couple more times, uh, but truthfully, the players today are the, guy, the guys who got it done. Uh, my God, uh, Danny pitched well. Uh, Dibble came in. I used him early today. Uh, tomorrow we got Rijo on the mound, and uh, Rijo's been going later on in the ball game uh, in the seventh or eighth inning, so possibly if everything goes according to plan tomorrow, I won't have to use Dibble at all. I can just give him a day off and get him ready for Wednesday and, and use the left-handers, Charlton or Myers. All right, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, sir. All right, let's go back to New York and Pat O'Brien. All right, Jim, thank you very much. A lot of energy there. Uh, we'll be back with the final thought after this. Thank you. It's always nice to win a game, but it is oh so sweet to win in somebody else's building. And there are the Cincinnati Reds after going up two games to one. And the skipper there in this series and it resumes uh, tomorrow. We'd like to remind you that uh, tonight here on CBS, uh, we begin with uh, Uncle Buck. That's not about Jack Buck. Uncle Buck, followed by Major Dad, and then followed by the 24th Annual Country Music Association Awards. Always celebrity packed in that event. Reminder that tomorrow we'll be back to bring you a league championship doubleheader beginning at 3 o'clock Eastern time with Game 3 of the American League uh, Pennant Contest. The Boston Red Sox trailing two games to none. We'll send out Mike Boddicker against the world champion Oakland A's. They'll count with Mike Moore. Then at 8 o'clock Eastern time, join us for Game 4 of the National League Championship Series. The Cincinnati Reds will start Jose Rijo. The Pittsburgh Pirates are coming back again with Bob Walk. And so, until tomorrow, for Jack Buck, Tim McCarver, James Brown, and Jim Gray, I'm Pat O'Brien. Good night, everybody. CBS Sports coverage of Game 3 of the 1990 National League Championship Series has been brought to you by Lexus LS400 and ES250 automobiles, the result of a relentless pursuit of perfection. Lennox, when it comes to quality and heating and cooling, must be a Lennox. And by AT&T, the right choice. Once again, the final score from Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh. The Reds six, the Pirates three, and Cincinnati takes a two games to one lead. You've been watching Major League Baseball on CBS Sports, the home of the League Championship Series and the World Series. Anybody who steps to the plate this time of year can make a big name for himself. And for Reds fans, Mariano Duncan is Mr. Big tonight.